Welcome to 15 Ways to Save $10,000 or More on College. I'm Catherine O'Brien and I am your host today. I am a homeschooler, have been since 1998. I know, so last century. Um, I founded Celtic College Consultants in 2004 and I've been serving families all across the country since then. I have an interesting mix of academic credentials in that I have an engineering degree from Northwestern undergrad, and then I have a master's in theology. So I guess that means I can do math and I can write. I have been an advocate for student and an educator for many, many years, and I am thrilled to be able to present this to you today. So I'm going to go through this quickly. There's 15 ways to save. I hope you're ready to take notes. Tip number one. Graduate in four, not six. The average in the U.S. is six years to graduate, and only a third of our public university students do, and just over half of our private college students do. That is pretty appalling. A lot of people think, well, maybe we'll start a community college because that's cheaper, but the median time to degree for students to start a community college is five and a half years. So median, as you remember from math a long, long time ago, if you line up the numbers from 1 to 100, median is 50. So half are above and half are below because it's literally from the most to the least. So that means that half the students are taking longer than five and a half years when they start at community college. So the thought of, oh, we'll go there for two and then the other school for two and we're done, rarely happens. Less than half the time. Career search. Know before you go and save. 75% of students are changing their major one to three times typically, and they're going to graduate with two semesters or more of extra or unusable credits. Because when I change from one major to another major, now I've got credits that no longer apply to the requirements for the degree that I'm earning. So we want to take time to do some career search, research, exploration, job shadowing, all that good stuff while we are in high school. It's going to pay off in a significant way. As you can see, graduating in four makes a big difference. So changing your major typically adds $50,000. So getting done and not finish, not adding that fifth year when you're gonna add another 50 or more because 60% of student loan debt is after year four. As you may or may not be familiar with, but financial aid comes for four years or eight semesters. You get a scholarship, it's for eight semesters, assuming you keep your grades up. You know, they give a, this program, that program, it's for four years at most. Sometimes it's just one. Most of the time it's for four. So that fifth year is a clunker because costs went from whatever they were, supported by the scholarships and things that you've gotten, to, oh, the whole enchilada. So this doesn't really include additional loans. You know, 7,500 is the max that you can take in the federal program, but a lot of kids are taking more than that that fifth year because they just don't have the money. Um, and then transferring, since you're going from this institution to that institution, usually in addition to changing a major, you're going to lose a lot of credits because the second school isn't going to accept all the credits from the first school. The courses don't match up. The requirements are different. So typically, students who are transferring are adding, and they're going to go for six years. So adding that second year adds almost $100,000. So by doing that career research, knowing our schools really well, ourselves really well, being in the right school to start with getting done in four, we are saving ourselves quite a bit of money. Okay, there are regional tuition discount programs. Some of these are called student exchanges. Uh, some of them are not. There are, I think, five of them. And there are groups of states, neighboring states, that have programs for the public universities. And typically they will charge you, instead of out-of-state tuition, they'll charge you 150% in, of in-state tuition, which I wrote saving four to $10,000, but I was just doing calculations for a student the other day and the difference at a lot of the schools was 15000 So not every school, and it's not every major. So you do need to do some research to find that. 
in your area. If you are in an area like I am right now, where the state I live in does not participate in any of these programs, the states nearby where I live, those schools have special programs of their own because they're trying to attract kids across the border. Um, that just always is a thing. It's a marketing thing. So you'll want to look for that. So if there's a regional program or if there's a local program. And if you're not sure, ask the colleges. But I will tell you that a lot of them do not advertise it. So you have to know that they exist. So go find it. If you go look it up or you ask them, they'll answer the question. But they typically are not proactive about it because they would rather have you pay full price. Because remember, admissions is also the sales and marketing department. So they are there to get your student for as much of your money as they can. Moving on. Promotional scholarships. So when we think of scholarships, typically we think of the 4.0, the athlete, you know, the things the student has done to earn a scholarship. But scholarships are, when we translate it out to regular English, they're really just coupons. They're enticements for you to purchase education at their institution. So we have master's colleges and liberal arts colleges are two categories of schools that are excellent schools, but they're typically only known within their region. And so they will use these scholarships for the vast majority, if not all of their students. So a master's college is a college that only offers bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. It's not a research university. They don't offer doctorates. And therefore the graduate students there typically are paying to go to school as opposed to working as TAs and graduate assistants. It's a very different situation there, um, but they are trying to attract students. They don't have some of the bells and whistles that a big research university does. And then liberal arts colleges who have gotten a very bad name but offer stellar education in many, many fields, um, typically are only known in their region, and so they use them as well to draw students. Because we have the keeping up with the Joneses thing. So, you know, if all the other schools like me are charging 60 or 65, we need to charge 60 or 65, or people are not going to realize that we are of the same academic caliber as they are, that our programs are just as robust as theirs. So we stay in that sixty to sixty-five thousand dollar range, maybe. Just giving you an example. But you know, when you come into the admissions tour, we let you know that hey, you know, everybody who comes here gets a ten thousand dollar scholarship. And I have been on campus tours, and literally, that's like the second sentence. Hi, my name is. And by the way, if you come here, you'll get a blah 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 scholarship to every single person who's thinking about coming, because that's. The way that they do it. So the real price is not 65, it's 55, you know, or 50 or whatever it is. Okay. So those exist. You want to maximize your need-based aid eligibility, and you want to choose colleges that meet a large percent of need. Collegedata.com is a place that you can see the percent of need met. If you don't know anything about financial aid, I suggest that you find out. I have talks on my YouTube channel, as well as I think I'm giving up another presentation at this conference. But you need to understand how need-based aid works, how to use a net price calculator, and what you can do to maximize your need-based aid eligibility. So a lot of that's government money. We're getting a chance to get it back. And schools don't all meet 100% of need. So say my family's contribution is 25,000 per the formula and the school costs 40. So the need is 15,000. Well, if the school only meets half of it, that means I'm going to pay my 25,000. That's my family contribution per the formula plus 7,500 of unmet need because the financial aid package is likely not going to have that. And so it's going to be, it's going to leave a shortfall. So now I'm paying even more than what I thought it was. And when most people get their expected family contribution from the formula, their heart starts pounding and like, ah, we can't afford this. And then you've got unmet need on top of it. So really understanding how to maximize your need-based aid is critical. 
letting Uncle Sam help, especially if you use a tax preparer, but even if you don't, there are tax credits and income deductions. Some of them are refundable, some of them are not. There are income limits and rules. Um, certain expenses need to exist during that calendar year to qualify for them. They can't be reused. There's a lot of fine print, but for many of us, especially homeschoolers, when we typically have more than one kid and, multi and, and only one income earner, a lot of us are going to qualify. And some of them can be taken on one return. Some can be taken on multiple returns. So there's a lot of different strategies in here. So make sure that you are availing yourself of these. And remember, if a student goes to college for four years, you're talking about five tax years, right? So they're going to graduate in 20. They're going to start college in 2020. And they're going to graduate in 2024. So it gives you 2020, 2021, 22, 23, and 24. That's five tax years. So don't forget that. Another way is working while you learn. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. So cooperative education programs exist primarily in engineering, but not exclusively. And these are programs that are paid internships, basically, that are part of the curriculum. And so this is the one place where not graduating in four makes sense. If I'm not graduating in four because I've taken two semesters and two summers to work a job you know, and getting paid about two thirds what starting pay is in my field. That is well worth it. So now I have income, I have experience, I have hopefully job references because I did a good job, hopefully a job offer from one of those companies or I'm working at the same company more than once. All of that adds up. So that's a thing. Federal work study is another program. It is a, the world of financial aid. It's a small piece of the pie but it's very helpful and that income does not count towards the student contribution for the next year's financial aid eligibility. So those are things to look for. There are also state work study programs in some states and some colleges have their own work study programs. So you'll want to look for that. And of course you could get a job outside of these opportunities as well. And then I wanted to share there are some excellent resources out there about alternative ways to work while you learn, which are not getting a job at the pizza joint kind of places, kind of thing. So kids can sell things, old electronics, their old textbooks, course notes. They can sell their papers for class. They can do crafts and artwork and photos, sell old clothes, jewelry. They can provide services, calligraphy, computer and phone repair, they can do nails, hair, makeup, especially for big events, sorority things. There's all kinds of things. They can do dog, baby, house sitting, <laughs> handyman work, gardening, errand, delivery boy stuff, running errands for the elderly, shopping for people, driving services, whether that's Uber or other. They can coach or model, cater, organize, clean. They can also teach, tutor, and translate. So there are lots of different opportunities to work, both in a structured way at an employer, as well as these more entrepreneurial ways of selling things or providing services that students can do while they are in college to earn money to help pay their expenses and lower the costs in a sense. Because if it's not mom and dad are not having to fill that bank account every month, that helps. And have our students fill in their own bank accounts. And then there's also employee benefit, employer benefit programs. There are dozens of companies in the country, um, some of them very well known like Starbucks, others less well known, um, that have tuition reimbursement programs for undergraduates. They can be big programs, they can be little programs. There are tax savings for the employers, so they are motivated to do this, and it can be a significant assistance to the, to the student employee as well. And it's not just for grad students. Um, there's just a whole variety, and it's not just full-time students either. So I would definitely uh, suggest you explore it. And actually, this talk is a synopsis or a summary of a free guide booklet that I wrote that's available on my website. 
And in that, I list a whole slew of companies and their and inf have information on their programs with their employee benefits. I have deep, more detail on all of these things, actually. But Okay, getting a head start on college is another way to save a lot. So I listed three testing programs and dual enrollment on here. So CLEP is college equivalency testing. It's also put on by the College Board. You can go to collegeboard.org and learn about the different the more than 30 different subjects that they have the tests in. And there's more than 700 colleges and universities that listed that accept those scores. AP exams, likewise College Board, those are only offered in May. Klepper, you can take any time and many, many sites all over. AP is just in May and at brick and mortar high schools around the world on certain dates for certain tests. And every, the colleges that accept those are not listed on the College Board website, unlike the CLEP where they are, um, but you can get the policies on both of these, all three of these actually, from the colleges themselves. And then DSST, uh, which is getcollegecredit.com. Um, this was initially the Dante program for military personnel to give credit for the things that they had learned, but it's been expanded. And there are lots and lots and lots of tests there that could be very helpful for lots of credits. And there's, you know, business skills and accounting in different areas. Um, so some of it is strictly academic, like, academic like the other two, and then others are other areas that we also teach in school, but um, we don't tend to think of being able to test out of. So I would encourage you to go look because they offer many, many, many subjects. And then dual enrollment, taking college classes while we're in high school, depending on where you live, tuition may be covered because you're a high school student. And you can certainly check with them and the universities you're applying to as far as transferability. But a lot of times they will take the credits or they will waive requirements and you will get credit for these things. And it's 75, 80 bucks a test, or maybe free, just renting the textbook for the dual enrollment. That's a lot cheaper than paying hundreds of dollars per credit hour at the university. So definitely check those out. Combined degrees. So we have 4.1, 4 plus one, 3 plus three, 3 plus two. There's all sorts of different programs. And that these are blended undergraduate and graduate school programs. You could see it for physical therapists, lawyers, doctors, lots of master's degrees will overlap. And so the students are actually taking graduate courses their senior year at undergraduate tuition rates typically. Um, and a year of school is getting cut out. So instead of being four years undergrad and then two or three for grad school, you're doing four plus one or three plus three. So you can see that the savings is there. It's not a typical way we think of this, but we are funding through the terminal degree, the degree that the student is really working towards. These programs can be super helpful. Some of them you apply for as you're applying to the college, others you apply while you're in college, because obviously you have to have high grades in college to qualify for them or to maintain your eligibility if you got accepted and you're on that track from when you're applied as a high school student. Okay, there are ways to earn money for college while you shop. So I, I named a few of them here. There's more information on these in the booklet you can get off my website. You promise Sage Scholars tuition rewards and then Swag Bucks is a new one. Um, so you'll want to explore those, but there are ways that doing what you normally would do, that a portion of those um, dollars are going to get put into these funds that you can use. And I have heard of people just paying for vast amounts of college with especially Sage Scholars. Um, so definitely want to check that out and see if that is something that you can use. Raise Me is relatively new, last few years, and there are participating colleges. So on the college side, this is a way of trying to coax more kids in. And you, the way it works is you set up a profile there and you log in your grades and different high school accomplishments and the colleges get to set how much they give you for it, but it's mini scholarships. And so obviously you don't cash in your chips for all the schools, but the one that you went to. 
the one that you're choosing. So if I'm going to ABC University and I've gotten 10 grand that I've, you know, over the four years of high school that I've qualified for through Raise Me, it gets applied in. So it's a mini scholarship thing um, and it applies to some schools and it keeps changing and growing which ones. So that's a way that you can earn some more as well. And most of the colleges aren't going to say, go check out our Raise Me and do that. It's up to us to know these things. So here I am trying to give you a helping hand. Okay, so asking relatives and friends to gift money for college. Some of us are not so comfortable with this. At the same time, if we're starting early, all of those birthday checks could be getting put into a 529 or some other savings plan for college as opposed to getting spent on another toy. Um, sometimes grandparents and other relatives will give gifts to parents to help. Sometimes a check will show up to the student. Sometimes an Amazon gift card will show up with a card, etc. Um, so there are lots of different ways to ask people and it can be an awkward conversation at the same time we know that the grandparents and other relatives want the kids to be able to go to college. And especially, like I had a lot of kids, I, we just didn't really need any more Legos. I'm sorry, you know, we could build a house out of Legos. So yeah, let's, instead of you know spending 50 bucks on that Lego thing, how about if we put 50 bucks in the, that kid's college fund or the family college fund that we could just use for whoever, you know, and just keep squirreling that away over the gears and building into something we can use. And there's a lot of different ways we can do investments in different things. But um, just something to think about that we don't necessarily think of, but it's money that they're already investing in our kids. You may think this one's a little bit odd to put in here, but staying married is hugely valuable. You're going to add familial and personal stability and financial strength, because when you rip it all apart, you need to sustain two households and everything that the two of you built up. A lot of it gets spent in attorney fees, and then it's divided. And you only have two parents for financial aid purposes and for many other things. I have a student that I'm working with right now. Parents are divorced. Both parents got remarried. So depending on the schools, so for the FAFSA, this child's going to have two parents. But there's other forms, and the schools look for other ways to gather information in cases like this. And so the kinds of schools that the student is looking at, he's going to have four parents that are all going to get tapped. And they're all going to be expected to contribute to his educational costs. So, but it's really not about the finances. It really isn't. It's better for everybody. So... There are lots of costs, and if you're trying to hang in there till the kids are grown and then it's going to be okay, there are studies showing that's not so great either. So spend some money on some counseling, do some hard work, work your way through it, find a way. Unless, of course, there's abuse or something awful, in which case we have different advice for you. Give me a buzz. I can help on many of those fronts, but I am not a marriage therapist. Okay, back to school. Scholarships. These get awarded lots of different ways. So for academics, field of interest, community service, they get awarded by scholarship contests, by colleges, by departments, and more. And what I mean by college and department is, so I go to ABC University, or like I went to Northwestern undergrad. So you have Northwestern University, and alumni and other people will make donations, and through the financial aid office, there'll be scholarships. And then, as I mentioned, the Technological Institute, there might be more scholarships for students in tech. And then the industrial engineering department might have scholarships just for students in the engineering department, in the industrial engineering department. So you'll want to knock on all of those doors. And at some schools, they have a separate page for scholarships that are like the alumni association have its own page of scholarships. Some schools run that all through the financial aid office. It depends on how they're set up. So there are many ways and as you notice, this is at the very end. <laughs> there have been lots of other things because they're not the be-all and end-all. And depending on where they come from and the rest of it, this may impact your need-based aid if you have any need. So 
It's not the go out and get scholarships and spend a million hours writing a zillion essays and get 50 bucks here and 50 bucks there. So for some of us, that 50 bucks and 50 bucks add up. But it can become a whole part-time job to do this. So for some people, that's cost-effective. For other people, some of these other ideas that I've shared are going to be more powerful. Lastly, be debt-free. You want to budget and save and then buy. Paying 124.99% may sound silly, but a lot of int interest rates on credit cards is 24.99%. So I bought something that's 100 bucks. I'm paying 100 bucks, and then I'm paying the 24.99% interest on that credit card balance that I'm carrying. And they keep sharing scary statistics with us of how much credit card debt people are paying. So do everything you can to work your way out of it. And, you know, I, Dave Ramsey's not everybody's favorite, but his debt snowball makes sense. You know, start with the smallest one, pay it off, and then throw it away and roll whatever you were paying into the next smallest one. So if you're paying, you know, $50 a month for the smallest one, when you're done paying it off, take that 50 bucks plus the minimum payment of the, the next one and pay that one off. And when that one's done, you know, roll that 175 bucks a month into the next one and just keep going till they're gone. So pay off the house if you can. You'll save, say, pay it off early if you can. You're going to save tens of thousands for college and free up cash flow. What about your home equity? Well, if it's a FAFSA-only school, they're never going to see it. So it doesn't matter. So it definitely makes a difference. So as I mentioned, these this is a very short summary of the booklet you can get for free from my website, which is CelticCollegeConsultants.com. If you'd like to meet to have a consultation with your family, I'd be happy to do that. If you go to CelticCollegeConsultants.FullSlate.com, select my name, you'll be able to schedule a professional consultation for your family. We will meet via Skype or FaceTime and explore your situation, answer your questions, and see how I can help. I hope you enjoy the conference.